And the final part of our lecture will be now on effective th theories which allow the existence of non-renormalizable operators. So we discuss EFT plus renormalization group uh, with dimension bigger than four operators. And um, this is not completely new because in the beginning of the semester we already had non-renormalizable operators in our very initial examples where we took scalar field theories and integrated out heavy particles at three level, we inevitably immediately obtained non-renormalizable operators. But then um, in the meantime, we discussed renormalization group and studied a lot of applications which are technically already quite advanced, where, however, the non-renormalizable operators didn't appear. But now we come back to them and discuss really effective field theories first and foremost with these higher dimensional operators and then also combine it with a renormalization group. And mainly it will be about examples uh, just to give you an idea and a flavor um, uh, to get into the subject which is uh, generally speaking a hot topic nowadays in elementary particle physics with a large number of applications. And therefore I will begin with examples. So three examples which are maybe the obviously most important examples um, for elementary particle physics and in connection to the standard model in various directions are uh, first of all standard model EFT or SMEFT or SMEFT in other words which is a well known effective field theory. There is also Higgs effective field theory or HEFT which is very similar to SMEFT but not quite the same and there is low energy effective field theory or LEFT and uh, let me just define or characterize what these uh, three field theories are. Um, as I said all of them are strongly connected to the standard model. Therefore, the basic application is um, twofold. Either you want to have precise predictions from within the standard model, then you can use the effective field theories as tools, as we have discussed, for example, last week with the Higgs mass calculation, which was used as a tool for precise calculations. Um, and you can use this uh, tool both exactly within the standard model as I said but also for extensions of the standard model where you integrate out heavy particles in the way we did it for the Higgs boson mass in supersymmetric theories or for grand unification. Um, uh, but the second uh, way to use these effective field theories is uh, to um, generally account for effects beyond the standard model. If you do not know what the correct theory beyond the standard model is, be it supersymmetry, non-supersymmetric particles, grand unification or something else, then uh, if the new physics is heavy, you can always integrate it out and you must obtain an effective field theory which contains the standard model because uh, we know that standard model particles exist. So they must also exist in any extension of the standard model which uh, should be uh, correct description of nature and uh, the standard model plus higher dimensional operators and then you could end up with uh, SMEFT or HEFT which are both theories um, which can account for heavy effects of heavy new particles. And so then uh, these two effective field theories can generally parameterize any effects of uh, heavy new physics and uh, therefore you can compare these effective field theories to experiment and learn to what extent new physics could be present in nature. So uh, this is the idea and so let me write down again such an energy diagram. Here is uh, an energy scale and let us distinguish let's say three energy scales and uh, in the middle there is the electroweak scale of the heaviest standard model particles the weak scale 
where there are important um, particles like the Z, the W boson, the top quark, the Higgs, um, or the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs boson. Above it, there could be potentially new physics beyond the standard model. Of course, we don't know about that, but maybe there is heavy new physics. BSM stands for beyond the standard model, beyond the standard model physics. And uh, just as examples, there could be uh, new Higgs bosons. There could be supersymmetry. There could be leptoquarks. And many other kinds of particles could exist uh, and could have masses which are much heavier than the masses of the electroweak particles which we know about. And then there is also the low scale. Um, this, this is the scale where there are all the light particles of the standard model starting from the bottom quark, tau lepton and lighter. And we will assume here that there is no uh, beyond the standard model physics here at such low energy scales. And that is um, not guaranteed because there could be a new physics also with particles which are extremely light if those particles have weak interactions. If light particles have strong interactions with uh, our detectors, then we would have seen them. So that cannot be true. But it can be that there exists light particles with very weak interactions, in particular weak interactions with quarks or photons that are um, present in everyday life. And such particles have, could have names like axions or uh, dark photon particles or particular kinds of dark matter particles uh, could be light and have weak interactions, but we assume them not to not be there. And if there are not such light particles, then it is clear that here um, below the heavy scale, there is just the standard model valid. Therefore, the standard model is by assumption the correct effective field theory. And uh, so whenever, um, whatever new physics exists with heavy masses, it must reduce to the standard model at low energies. And so therefore, below this heavy scale, the standard model is the correct effective field theory. Uh, and on the other hand, below the weak scale, we know exactly what kind of physics there is, namely the light sector of the standard model. And then it might make sense to integrate out these known standard model particles and of course also any uh, additional even heavier BSM particles. And then what we remain with is a theory which contains only the light known quarks and leptons and the photon and the gluon. So maybe let me add here plus photons and gluons, which are the only light um, bosons, fundamental bosons, that there are in the standard model. So, therefore, let me now characterize uh, these three effective field theories, and the first one is this low energy effective field theory, left which is an effective field theory at the low scale. So it is valid below the weak scale. It contains precisely the five light quarks, starting with the bottom and all the lighter quarks of the first two generations. It contains all the leptons and neutrinos. And it contains the light bosons, namely the photon and the gluons. And uh, they must be associated with gauge invariants. And therefore, this theory has U1 electromagnetic times SU3 color gauge invariants. So it has a different gauge invariance than the full standard model because it has precisely only the gauge invariance corresponding to the light massless gauge bosons. Yes? So it may be a trivial question, but why does it still have SU3 invariance? 
because of the gluons. The gluons are massless. Each quark has three colors, and uh, SU3 acts on the color indices of the three quarks. Yeah. Um, I mean, you might worry about um, the fact of uh, there is no matching anymore between the number of quarks and the number of leptons. And in the standard model, is this actually a crucial that uh, there is an equal number of quarks and leptons because of so-called anomaly cancellation? Uh, without this matching number, uh, there is a so-called gauge anomaly in the standard model, which makes the theory inconsistent. However, that is only true because of the SU2 cross U1 weak interactions, and uh, they are not existing anymore here, uh, as we call it technically. This is a vector-like gauge theory, where left-handed and right-handed quarks interact in the identical ways. And for this reason, there is no anomaly, and you can have an independent number of quarks and leptons without ruining the consistency of the theory. So this is the gauge group of the theory. And then the Lagrangian of this uh, low energy EFT is simply given by the Lagrangian of QED plus QCD with the appropriate, um, uh, let's say, five quarks plus leptons. Um, just the obvious kinetic terms for all the quarks and all the leptons in this theory with the appropriate covariant derivatives. And then there exists a higher dimensional operators, let's say sum over i, of um, so-called coefficients ci times oi. And here these are now higher dimensional operators, so dimension bigger than four operators, which are u1 times SU3 gauge invariant. And they are constructed out of the fields of this theory. So they are constructed out of the five quark fields, the six lepton fields, and uh, the photon and gluon fields, or field strength tensors. Since they are non-renormalizable, they co can contain high numbers of derivatives, but it must be appropriate covariant derivatives in order to guarantee gauging variance. And uh, just to give you a reference, so this uh, theory, so it's, um, let's say, the basic use is not so young, but uh, just recently, these uh, higher dimensional operators have been fully classified, and I give you the reference where this has been done. Jenkins Manohar and Stoffer just in 2018. Uh, they wrote down the precise definition of the Lagrangian, including a classification of all these higher dimensional operators. I mean, not all because there are infinite, but uh, of the first dimension five, then dimension six operators. And applications of this are, for example, B physics. So that means decays of B quarks. So the B quarks decay via weak interactions. But the weak interactions corresponding to exchange of W boson can be integrated out. So in this uh, low energy EFT, there are no W bosons anymore. So the beam uh, quarks decay uh, because of these higher dimensional operators. And uh, so in this sense, you can understand in this simple theory that uh, the weak interactions are weak because they are suppressed by this one over m square in front of those higher dimensional operators, which always suppresses um, all effects coming from the weak interactions. And, uh, but then in this effective field theory, you can do QCD and QED corrections to the weak decays, and this effective field theory provides a very systematic framework 
to precisely compute such QCD and QED corrections to weak decays. So, and in that sense, the, the setup is not new because already in the 1990s, there was a huge effort worldwide, one can say, to precisely calculate such decays of B quarks because uh, in the 2000s, there were several big experiments done in the USA and in Japan, the so-called B factories, where B decays were measured very accurately. This has now been superseded also by the Large Hadron Collider and by another B physics experiment in Japan. But because of this precision of the experiments, there was a worldwide effort in theory to calculate uh, these decays precisely, and that was done using this setup. And the exercise that we do um, illustrates this. Um, okay, uh, so B physics decay is one application, but uh, at even lower energies. Um, you can also study muon physics, like for example, uh, the magnetic moment G minus two of the muon, or mu two E conversion processes. And many other phenomena which happen at low energies. Uh, so one kind of interesting phenomenon that happens at low energies would also be electric dipole moments, which are similar to magnetic dipole moments, but uh, they are CP violating and therefore have never been measured for elementary particles, but one looks for them. And all these effects can be described in this low energy EFT. So that is one application or one example of an EFT where higher dimensional operators matter. And this EFT is in particular a tool to do more precise calculations um, for the standard model. For the reasons that we discussed, I mean, uh, as we said, if you do a calculation in the fundamental theory, you will often inevitably uh, end up with large logarithms and perturbation theory doesn't converge well. But if you go to a proper effective field theory, you have control over the logs and therefore the calculations are simply more precise. And here in particular in B physics, you have QCD corrections, uh, which are very large and therefore uh, using this EFT is a big advantage. So this EFT, also the, the main left, do not tell us from which theory we are doing the matching? This no, it does not. I mean, uh, the effective field theory is general. and. Uh, if we start from the standard model, then you can explicitly construct the coefficients in the Lagrangian, which means, technically speaking, that the values of those coefficients ci would be predicted as functions of the fundamental standard model parameters. Um, but you can also um, use this theory by uh, using those coefficients as experimental input then you would measure them and afterwards do a calculation in terms of the CI uh, and you predict one observable and uh, use another observable to measure the values of the CI, then you can within the EFT do correct predictions. And then you are basically independent of whether the theory derives from the standard model or from something else. In that sense, you would in this moment not test the validity of the standard model, but you would uh, infer um, correct uh, general correlation between low energy observables. And uh, then you would need to take the measurements of the CI after you have consistent description of experiment. You would have values of the CI coming from measurements and you could compare them to a prediction of the CI from the standard model or from competing theories. And then in this way, you could say, okay, the standard model is right or some alternative to the standard model is correct. So in a way, it's maybe not done exactly in this uh, language, but uh, the measurement of G minus two of the muon is of course an example where we measure essentially one such coefficient, namely the coefficient in front of the magnetic dipole moment operator, which is one of the dimension six operators here. And uh, once 
uh, we know the measurement we can compare to the prediction of the coefficient from the standard model or from SUSI and so on. And as you know, there are some uh, intriguing discrepancies there, which might mean that there is new physics in this observable. Okay, so let us look at the other two examples. SMEF, standard model EFT. Uh, this is an effective field theory which directly generalizes the standard model. So the Lagrangian of this uh, SMEF or SMEFT is given by the standard model Lagrangian plus higher dimensional operators. And here, these uh, operators are gauge invariant under the full standard model gauge group. So the standard model gauge group is SU3 for color, SU2 for the left-handed quark and lepton doublets, and U1 hypercharge. And, uh, we take here only operators constructed out of the standard model fields with this gauge invariance. Gauge invariant dimension bigger than four operators constructed out of the standard model fields. And the particular detail is that this includes the Higgs doublet. And the last remark will change in this other EFT, the heft or Higgs effective field theory. But here in the SMEFT, this is the most obvious effective field theory. You take the standard model as you know it and just write down gauge invariant higher dimensional operators. As a nice um, small introduction to this, I again recommend the um, paper by Manohar, which we had already referenced with this archive number. Which contains a brief summary of uh, the EFT. So some words about the applications. So this allows a general description of all phenomena um, which could come from heavy new physics beyond the standard model. So heavy beyond the standard model physics. which contains a light fixed doublet. Okay, and so that covers a huge number of um, scenarios for physics beyond the standard model and most of uh, them, you know, like uh, the supersymmetric standard model would reduce to this uh, in, at low energies um, theories with heavy particles like leptoquarks, if you integrate them out, would reduce uh, to this theory. So many uh, obvious and uh, much discussed extensions of the standard model contain heavy particles, and once you integrate them out, you end up with an effective field theory, which contains the standard model um, plus higher dimensional operators of this kind. And by the way, at the dimension four level, the standard model cannot be changed. And uh, can you think of, or do you understand the reason why the standard model actually must remain unchanged? Why can it not change compared to uh, the pure standard model if you have heavy new physics? Why we only have like dimension greater than four operators? 
Yes, so why, if, if we say we have any new physics beyond the standard model which is heavy, uh, let's have an example, laptop quarks. Laptop quarks, um, in addition to the standard model, we integrate out the laptop quarks and we obtain a low energy EFT. Why does the dimension four part of this low energy EFT um, agree fully with the actual standard model? Um, that can be um, said in this way. So this reason is correct. You could phrase it differently, um, but I would say the reason is correct. The way I would say it is that the standard model is, has a Lagrangian which is the most general Lagrangian which is in agreement with the fundamental symmetries, in particular gauge invariance. So if you ask, uh, I know that there exists only the standard model fields and there are no other fields than the standard model ones. And we have this gauge invariance of the standard model. If we know these two items and then you write down the most general Lagrangian which is compatible with the two, then this is the standard model Lagrangian. There is no more general Lagrangian in agreement with gauge invariance uh, than the one of the standard model. The only thing that can differ are the numerical values of the parameters in front of the terms in the standard model Lagrangian. But that is still the standard model itself. For example, supersymmetry uh, reduces to the standard model at low energies, but with a specific prediction that the quartic Higgs coupling lambda is not a free parameter, but can be calculated from SUSY parameters. But that is still the standard model Lagrangian. So you're right in saying the standard model is renormalizable and that is just a compact way of saying that the standard model Lagrangian contains all terms which are gauge invariant because otherwise it wouldn't be renormalizable. So that is the reason. Yep. I'm pretty sure we have um, discussed this in the lecture sometime, but could you remind me why the dim greater, as a dimension greater than four operators needs to be the exact same gauge group as the Lagrangian and not maybe another one from a Okay, this is in a way an assumption. So the assumption here is that uh, the um, symmetry uh, in the full theory is uh, the same or contains the symmetry of the standard model. So maybe that wouldn't have to be the case. However, um, if it weren't, then uh, it would violate observational um, or uh, wouldn't agree with experiment. So because we see experimentally that at low energies, there exists the gauge bosons that we know. We have measured their properties and they can only consistently exist in a theory which has this gauge invariance. Therefore, it is quite clear that an extension of the standard model must contain the same gauge group, maybe additional um, gauge groups or a higher rank gauge group, but uh, it must contain this at least as a subgroup. And so therefore, um, this is a reasonable assumption, but it is an assumption that the fundamental dynamics at high scales has the same symmetry than the standard model itself. And then uh, we assume that the symmetry is present in the higher dimensional operators. So it basically uh, is part of the assumption that goes into the definition of the theory. And now I want to say just very few words on this alternative EFT, which might uh, give you some food for thought in, in a similar direction. But I wouldn't, uh, hadn't planned uh, to say too much about it. Um, just as an illustration, because there are some subtle details uh, in these assumptions which uh, matter. And so here is the difference between SMEFT and HEFT. Namely, this is a further generalization, which is probably not totally obvious for you, um, given at least what we have discussed so far in our semester here, um, which is um, appropriate if the heavy new physics um, reduces to the standard model, but um, not uh, with a light Higgs doublet, but only with a light um, Higgs boson, a Higgs particle, which is light and uh, agrees with the Higgs boson that we have seen experimentally. But the Higgs uh, in this approach is not accompanied 
by the unphysical Goldstone boson degrees of freedom, which transform into the Higgs in the way they do in the standard model. So the Goldstone bosons are anyway not observable. And so the assumptions um, of the gauge transformations between Higgs and Goldstone bosons, that is loosened in this heft theory. So it is a generalization if the heavy new physics um, does not lead to a light Higgs doublet. only to light Higgs boson. And uh, the way the theory is then formulated is with a so-called nonlinear realization of uh, the Higgs mechanism. very roughly speaking, instead of a doublet, let's call it capital Phi, where the doublet could be written as an unphysical Goldstone boson, G plus, and here V plus one over square root of two Higgs field plus I times a neutral Goldstone boson. That is the Higgs doublet, which is used in the standard model and also in SMEFT, and the gauge transformation would transform V plus the Higgs field into the charged Goldstone or the neutral Goldstone boson. Um, but in this nonlinear realization, basically you have V plus uh, Higgs field over square root of two times an exponential of I times uh, yeah, some function of the Goldstone bosons. Let's write it simply, uh, simply like this. And uh, then this Higgs field is completely gauge invariant and uh, you do not have any constraints in the Lagrangian for the way the Higgs would enter. And the gauge transformations affect only the exponent which depends on the Goldstone bosons. And then you have additional freedom in the way the Higgs field can enter in the Lagrangian. And this additional freedom can be necessary if the fundamental new physics, um, as I said, does not lead to a light Higgs doublet, but to a more general Higgs sector. So there are some extensions of the standard model which reduce to this, but not to SMEFT. And uh, that depends on the details of the Higgs sector realization in the fundamental theory. And anyway, this is a general generalization. It can uh, reduce in special cases to this SMEFT, so therefore this is more general than the upper effective field theory, and it is sometimes necessary. And I just want to uh, give you a reference. So it has been worked on by a few people, but in particular I uh, um, recommend strongly uh, all the papers by Buchala about this theory. He has worked on it extensively, uh, given many talks and uh, written papers about it, and which are very nice to read. Okay, so this uh, is a set of three examples of effective field theories which are actually discussed in elementary particle physics and uh, which contain higher dimensional operators. And now we would look at some details and then calculate a few examples. Okay, so some words about the general structure of all of these theories. So let's say we have such an effective field theory Lagrangian with higher dimensional operators. Then the Lagrangian has a structure L with operators up to dimension four plus the higher dimensional operators sum over I 
some coefficients, capital CI times operators OI. And then uh, just intro to introduce this uh, term, so these coefficients are often called Wilson coefficients. These are the basically coupling constants in front of uh, the additional terms in the Lagrangian. But the language is that you do not say terms in the Lagrangian, you say operators which are multiplied by Wilson coefficients. So these are the dimension bigger than four operators. And okay, um, I wanted to introduce here um, Maybe sometimes it is useful to simply write everything as a sum of uh, coefficients times operators. You know, I didn't, um, so including dimension less or equal to four. So optionally, of course, every term in the Lagrangian has this form, clearly. Um, and sometimes it is useful to separate off the higher dimensional operators. Sometimes it is useful to write everything um, in a uniform way, and that way you have, of course, the simplest representation of the Lagrangian. Um, but what is more important uh, about these Wilson coefficients, capital C, so, um, is the normalization and the dimensionality. So these higher dimensional operators um, uh, must be multiplied with coefficients which have a unit one over mass to some power in order for the Lagrangian to be dimension four as it has to be. Therefore, these Wilson coefficients have um, inverse mass units. And so it is sometimes useful and very often done, in fact, to separate out uh, this unit of mass by um, multiplying with a prefactor. So very often you would see something like this that uh, the capital C is written as a small c divided by a mass to the appropriate power ni, where this small c is now dimensionless, dimensionless Wilson coefficient, and uh, this exponent of the heavy mass is an appropriate power. of some heavy reference mass. So, and whenever we have done an explicit um, calculation where we started with a known fundamental theory and where we did integrate out heavy particles, then it was always automatically guaranteed that indeed the Wilson coefficients are suppressed by powers of the heavy mass, and in that case the heavy mass was the mass of some propagator of a heavy particle or something similar. Um, and if we do not know the fundamental theory, but we just assume that SMEFT, for example, is a correct description of any unknown BSM physics, then we simply have to assume that the coefficients are similarly suppressed by one uniform heavy mass scale, and then the suppression is again part of the assumption of the definition of SMEFT. Um, okay, so then I wanted to refer you to the power counting analysis that we have already done. Uh, that was uh, section four, two, three, where we analyzed uh, how Feynman diagrams um, contribute if you have several higher dimensional operators in the Feynman diagram, and therefore the Feynman diagram will be suppressed by some high power of the products of all these one over masses. Yeah. 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 Um, what if we, for instance, would like to write down the EFT, which has, um, which has mass matched to different um, mass scales? For instance, we say we expect new physics at um, somewhere below the, um, above the weak scale, but below the Scale, hmm. So we have two reference masses, yes. reference scales. Yes. Um, how would we then arrange the EFT expansion? Yes. Um, one thing that, uh, that is maybe the most explicit uh, way would be uh, to set up a tower of effective field theories. You start uh, from the most fundamental one 
at the highest energy scales and then you integrate out in steps. So if you have a stepwise uh, hierarchy of scales, then you start integrating out the heaviest ones, you get higher dimensional operators with one over the heaviest mass scale with appropriate powers. Then you go to lower energies and integrate out the next um, particles corresponding to the next lower energy scales and you get additional higher dimensional operators suppressed by that mass scale and so on. So you would have here several reference masses corresponding to the different energy scales in your hierarchy of um, fundamental theories. So that would for sure be possible and it is also sometimes done in practice and um, you get a more complicated power counting behavior. Sometimes you can get away with a simpler approach where maybe you only go to the lowest of all these energy scales and integrate out at that scale everything. And then uh, formally everything might only be suppressed by the lightest of those heavy scales. Uh, but then um, the explicit calculation might tell you that, ah, okay, some coefficients are further suppressed because they actually originate from even heavier new physics. Um, then you might have only one EFT instead of a tower of effective field theories, but um, secretly the coefficients would still uh, inherit this hierarchy of scales by having different values corresponding to where they come from. So that could be a simpler approach, which might not always be good enough, but uh, you can imagine it to work in some cases. Right, I just wanted to write down here a sentence. So uh, our conclusion at the time was that if you work at finite accuracy, then you only need a finite number of Feynman diagrams and a finite number of operators and a finite number of loops. Finite number of diagrams, operators, or loops required. And that was important because uh, this shows that the EFTs have predictive power, even though in principle the Lagrangian contains infinitely many terms with infinitely many parameters, but only a finite number matters as long as you restrict yourself to some range of phenomena with a certain limited accuracy. So from that point of view, the EFT is as good as a renormalizable theory. So um, this is the general structure of the Lagrangian and now let me tell you a few words on the renormalization of this effective field series with higher dimensional operators regarding basically the structure of renormalization. So and here I would like to refer to um, article, long description by Buras, uh, with this archive number, in particular uh, in his section 543. And uh, the basic upshot is that renormalization of EFTs is uh, not different from the renormalization of any quantum field theory that you know. So there is no difference from renormalizable quantum field theories. And so in that sense, we could stop here uh, because really everything works as in the renormalizable case. But let me nevertheless uh, tell you a few details in order maybe to clarify this a little bit more. So you need a bare Lagrangian. And the bare Lagrangian, um, I copy basically what we wrote um, in the general chapter on renormalization of our lecture. The Bayer Lagrangian can be split into the classical Lagrangian plus counterterm Lagrangian. And now I use this uh, simpler notation here. The Lagrangian is, of course, a sum of operators times coefficients. Um, and uh, so, therefore, we can write this as a sum of um, Bayer coefficients times bare operators. And what do I mean by this? 
And here the bare coefficients are, of course, given by the renormalized coefficients plus the renormalization constants. So to highlight this, let me say here CI renormalized plus delta CI. So this is then finite and renormalized. And uh, as usual, we would say uh, this is the basis of the perturbative expansion. So in the pert perturbative expansion, we would take these renormalized expressions as the tree level expressions. So they are of classical order, they are of lowest order, whereas the delta CI are of higher order in the perturbative expansion. And they contain divergences. Uh, which of course make the theory finite but they might also contain finite parts. And the finite parts depend on the renormalization scheme. So all of this is identical to what we said before. And here, these bare operators, they um, are expressed in terms of uh, the so-called bare fields. And derivatives. And the bare field operators can again also be related to renormalized fields using a field renormalization factor. So just to clarify, uh, everything about this statement uh, is identical to renormalizable theories, except that the Lagrangian now is allowed to contain terms of dimension bigger than four. Um, and here I need to add one further remark, namely, in general, what are the allowed operators in the Lagrangian? We alluded to it already, and here I want to write it down explicitly. We need all uh, terms which are allowed by the symmetries, because all terms allowed by the symmetries might be necessary in order to cancel divergences. So we must write them into the bare Lagrangian with some coefficients which is allowed to be non-zero. So need all operators allowed by symmetries. And if we work at finite accuracy, then we can also check a priori which operators are allowed by power counting. All of this is completely general and not specific to renormalizable theories. Uh, the special um, detail in renormalizable theories is if you ask what is the set of all operators allowed by symmetries and power counting, then power counting in the renormalizable case means that if you start with a renormalizable Lagrangian, uh, all divergences only appear in the renormalizable terms, and therefore all the counter terms and all terms in the bare Lagrangian are also renormalizable. And therefore, if you start with a Lagrangian which contains only dimension four or less terms, the counter terms also are of dimension four or less. And then you have only a finite number of terms in the bare Lagrangian also in the counter term Lagrangian and in the classical Lagrangian and a finite number of coefficients and you end up with a theory like QED with just two parameters or the standard model with just about 20 parameters or so. Whereas if you start out with a non-renormalizable Lagrangian, 
then at higher orders, you create more and more divergencies corresponding to higher and higher dimensionality in the operators, and ultimately you need an infinite number of operators to cancel all divergencies. And uh, that is why the theories are historically called non-renormalizable, because it appears like non-predictive power, but because of this power counting argument, we know that there is actually sufficient predictive power, and so all is well. Are there some questions about this? Okay, then uh, let me talk specifically about one special case uh, which is very important for the applications. Namely, let us suppose we work specifically at the level of dimension six operators. So that is very frequent in practical applications. Only dimension six operators. So first of all, uh, you might wonder why dimension six and not dimension five, because dimension five is obviously uh, would be first. Um, dimension six comes later. But in many practical cases, there are no uh, dimension five operators that you should consider. They are just absent. And therefore, the first non-renormalizable operators of interest are of dimension six. And then, uh, if that is enough to stick um, for your accuracy that you desire just to dimension six operators, then this is the special case that I want to consider now. So, let's say, um, for example, no one over M terms exist. And not interested in one over M to the four corrections. So if both of this is true, then dimension six is enough. Then our Lagrangian looks as follows. So L bear is given by uh, the renormalizable part. Bear plus just dimension six operators, only dimension six. Ci bear times Oi bear. And now we know the dimensionality of all those Wilson coefficients. Namely, they have all the same dimensionality. So this uh, Ci bear unit is always 1 over m square. They have all the same dimensionality. So, and then if you renormalize, you also know if uh, there are no non-renormalizable operators, the theory is renormalizable. That means if the uh, CI without bear are zero, then the delta CI are zero as well, because the theory is renormalizable. So maybe I here three equal signs. I mean CI equals zero for all I. So if there are no Wilson coefficients at all, then the theory is renormalizable and then we do not need counter terms for the Wilson coefficients. Absolutely. Yes, so for all I. So and if at least one of them is non zero, then the theory is non renormalizable and then in principle, all of the delta ci might be non-zero because you have no control anymore. But if all of them are zero, then for sure you do not need any counter terms. So, and uh, that is one piece of information. And the second piece of information is the dimensionality. So all the delta ci and the ci have a unit of one over m square. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that means. So if we have just one operator, for example, in the, in the dimension six, we need to construct nevertheless all delta C's for all possible gauge invariant operators. Exactly, so that is the general situation. So if one of them is non-zero, then uh, you would expect uh, that all uh, Feynman diagrams corresponding to dimension six green functions would be divergent. 
not only a Feynman diagram corresponding to precisely this term, and we will see examples of this. And uh, if you look at the examples, uh, then you will not be surprised. Uh, on general grounds, maybe it might look surprising, but uh, think about it from the general renormalization point of view. Um, all counter terms uh, which are in principle possible are normally required. That simply means if by power counting you, you cannot prove that something is finite, it will most likely be divergent. And here, uh, if at least one of them is non-zero, the theory is non-renormalizable, and then you expect that everything is divergent, which corresponds to dimension six. So, but now the point. What do we now know about the result for the delta ci in this specific case, having set all these pieces of information? So the delta ci must be some function um, of all the parameters in the theory. Okay? So uh, we start with tree level, and now some of these uh, coefficients are non-zero. We calculate the divergences or apply some renormalization scheme, and then we have some divergent and possibly finite contribution in the renormalization constants. But uh, what is the dependence of these uh, counter terms on all the parameters of the theory? The parameters of the theory are now the parameters um, of the renormalizable part and the non-vanishing ci, which are of dimension one over m square. So we have a result which contains one over m square prefactor, and we have available um, dimensionless parameters and all the one over m square parameters. And we are not interested in one over m to the four corrections. Therefore, it must be a linear expression in the CI. Oh, oh it should be write it. Let's write it like this. Delta Z i j subscript C times the tree level CI renormalized coefficients. That is the only possibility. Again, for dimensional reasons, uh, there must be um, at least one power of those terms. Uh, and since we by definition neglect one over m to the four, uh, we get a linear relationship. And these uh, dimensionless prefactors, they can in principle depend on all the other parameters, like for example, gauge couplings, Yukawa couplings, and so on. Uh, maybe let me first write another equation, so, it, uh, so the bare parameters, then ci bare, they would be written simply as a matrix, z i j superscript c times the renormalized terms. And then uh, the piece of information on the set or delta set can depend on all parameters of L up to dimension four. So the point is uh, that this is now a linear relation. And uh, so you can view this as a matrix valued mixing between operators. Operator mixing is not yet obvious, but it is a matrix valued mixing between the Wilson coefficients for sure. So, and uh, this is quite different from the way renormalization constants look like and behave in a renormalizable theory because there is never a linear relationship between um, renormalization constants and fundamental parameters. So, just to compare. Um, let's say the coupling renormalization in phi to the four theory. Who remembers what was the renormalization constant delta G in phi to the four theory? 
that was coming from such Feynman diagrams. So it contains two powers of the coupling. So it was something like 1 over 32 pi square times 1 over epsilon times g square plus maybe finite corrections depending on the renormalization scheme. So delta g is proportional to g square. Or in QED, delta e in QED was something like 1 over 12 pi square times 1 over epsilon cube plus finite corrections depending on the renormalization scheme. So here delta E is proportional to E cube. So there is normally not a linear relationship between parameters and renormalization constants. But for the dimension 6 Wilson coefficients, if we are only interested in dimension 6, there exists such a linear relationship with prefactors, which however are such functions of uh, all the normal coupling constants. Okay, so this is a new phenomenon uh, which exists just for dimension six. Or whenever you have just one uniform dimensionality of operators um, of relevance. And uh, now let me uh, tell you about a reformulation which is very often used in, um, let's say, discussing about this. Um, which is a point of view of operator renormalization. So here, so far, we have uh, used a point of view which you could call renormalize the Lagrangian or renormalize the parameters and fields of the theory. Um, but now we view the same thing differently uh, and introduce the term operator renormalization. Let me just clean the blackboard. So basically, we write the bare Lagrangian in two ways. Namely, on the one hand, Let's use this general notation where we just write everything as ci times oi. So then we have ci uh, bare times oi bare. Um, and what we know is that the bare Lagrangian generates finite green functions. or let's say finite uh, theory. Let's be a little bit more careful because as we have already discussed, sometimes you, we use field equations to simplify the Lagrangian and so on in EFTs. And then uh, we do not necessarily generate finite green functions, but only finite S matrix elements. Um, and, but whatever we um, aim for doing, uh, the quantities we are interested in, they are now finite by uh, this uh, Bayer Lagrangian. And we have just written the formula for the Bayer Wilson coefficients. Uh, therefore, this is equal to the following namely, Zij times Cj renormalized times o, no, Oi Bayer. So uh, this is the same. Therefore, this also generates finite green functions. Um, and here, these are the bare Wilson coefficients and bare operators. So you generate finite green functions by having bare coefficients and bare operators in the Lagrangian. But we can also write it equivalently as sum over j of the renormalized Wilson coefficients times renormalized operators or renormalized j. Then we have here renormalized Wilson coefficients 
and we normalized operators. And what is the required definition for this to hold? Obviously, we simply uh, identify it differently. We identify the product of the matrix Z times O bear as a renormalized operator. Then this is just the same thing, but just uh, written differently. So we multiply these two to define the renormalized operator. And then we would say we generate a finite theory by writing into our Lagrangian just finite renormalized coefficients, but multiplied with renormalized operators. So that is the different but equivalent point of view. We now write down the definition precisely. So we can introduce a new operator mixing matrix. I will call it ZO, which is the previous matrix ZC to minus one and transpose. And uh, then we have the following relationship, namely OJ renormalized is equal to, first of all, ZC IJ times OI there. So that is the obvious relationship coming from the previous formula. So that is therefore the correct definition of the renormalized operators. But if I introduce this um, new mixing matrix Z, which is the inverse and transpose, then I can put this here and bring it to the other side of the equation. And then we could equivalently say the bare operator OI is given by the matrix ZO for the operators with index IJ times the renormalized operator OJ. And so basically, you see now on top of each other the two equations, which are equivalent. You cannot use both at the same time, but you can either say I renormalize my theory in the usual way by um, doing a Transform if a renormalization transformation of all the parameters and fields in your theory. That gives you um, naturally bare operators which contains bare fields and bare coefficients in the Lagrangian which have some renormalization constants which are proportional uh, to the original parameter. So that is the thing that you are used to. But now the equivalent statement is that you can renormalize your theory by uh, not doing anything to the parameters in the Lagrangian, they always remain finite and they do not receive renormalization constants or counter terms, but instead you renormalize the operators. And the operators are renormalized uh, in this way, which is related to the previous uh, renormalization transformation by basically the inverse matrix. So uh, the Lagrangian would then contain um, these renormalized operators, which can be constructed out of uh, the bare operators by applying this matrix. So, and this is a language which is sometimes used in this field where you would construct the renormalization matrix for the operators, and then you would say, okay, how do I need to renormalize the operators of dimension six? They again renormalize with such a linear relationship. So you have bare dimension six operators, renormalized dimension six operators. They are connected by a matrix transformation, uh, which is a function of the ordinary parameters of the theory. And this contains, of course, one over epsilon poles. So you would have equations like bare operator equal some function with one over epsilon times a linear combination of renormalized operators. And then once you put the renormalized operators into your Lagrangian, multiplying with finite coefficients, you automatically generate a finite theory. That is also a nice way to look at it. To say it in simple terms, once you know what the renormalized operators are, you can simply write down a Lagrangian with an arbitrary linear combination of the renormalized operators and always generate finite theories with it. I think you have an urgent question. 
Okay. Good. Okay. And uh, so this equivalence between the two points of use is also what is nicely explained in the um, where is it in the reference by Buras that I wrote down initially. So some remarks on the operator basis. So, if you require equality for green functions, so effective field theory equal to full theory. For all green functions of the theory, this is the most detailed requirement that, uh, that you can um, achieve then you need simply uh, all operators. Okay, but now there are some uh, possibilities to restrict yourself. For example, if um, you require only equality for physical quantities for S matrix elements and observables, then you need less. So then we can simplify using field redefinitions. or equations of motion. As we have already seen, that was section 421 and section 1 in our lecture. And similarly, it is about finiteness. If you require finiteness of all green functions, then your Bayer Lagrangian and the counter terms need to contain everything. However, if you are happy, if only the S matrix is finite, the counter term structure can be equivalently simplified. So then the same simplification can be applied to the counter terms. And the final remark is about gauge theories. Their gauge invariance is technically replaced by PRST. Invariance and the Lagrangian must be invariant under this new BRST symmetry even after you do gauge fixing, as we discussed in some lectures. But uh, the point I want to make here is simpler. So you can change um, the Lagrangian and also the Bayer Lagrangian by adding total BRST transformations. That is, for example, done in order to obtain a gauge fixing term. But uh, you do not only need to construct a gauge fixing in this way, you can generally change the Lagrangian by total BRST transformations. And you do not change the physics by this. And here, in this case, it simply means that it is sufficient to have fully gauge invariant operators in the Lagrangian. If 
you are only interested in describing physics correctly. So that is why if you look into the literature of uh, on these EFTs, like left or SMEFT or HEFT, then you will see discussions of the list of all relevant operators, and these are only gauge invariant operators, as I uh, stressed from the beginning. Um, but in general, you might think about operators which are not gauge invariant, but only BRST invariant, and they might be necessary in some cases if you want to have equality between an EFT and the full theory for off-shell green functions. But they are not necessary if you are only interested in physical observables. So let us now come to discussing the exercise. The exercise exemplifies operator mixing and uh, is one of the simplest examples of this operator mixing where you have a concrete relevant case which was relevant in the context of this B physics, of physics of B decays or also of other decays, generally speaking of weak decays where um, the weak interaction generates a decay of a heavy quark into lighter quarks. And uh, then, as we will discuss, at lowest order perturbation theory, only one single operator is relevant. So the EFT that you need to describe the decay contains precisely one such dimension six operator. But once you want to renormalize the theory um, with QCD corrections, then you generate two operators which mix by a two by two matrix. So in a way, this is maybe the simplest example of such a mixing of operators and that is why I wanted to look at it. And let us interconnect the lecture and the exercise a little bit. So today we have 10 more minutes and I will give you some hints of what you might uh, be able to do until Wednesday uh, when we then can discuss more on the exercise. So maybe let's make this uh, section 7.3 in application to BD case. And I will not write the references, they are on uh, the exercise sheet. And so one example would be a B quark decay into charm quark and anti up quark and D quark. And so that is a Feynman diagram in the standard model. B quark goes in goes into a charm quark and a W boson, and then the W boson decays into an anti-up and a down quark. Then at all these vertices, uh, electric charge is conserved, so that would be a W minus uh, boson exchanged from left to right here. Then charge is conserved and also QCD color is conserved at each vertex. One color quark goes in, the same uh, color of the other quark goes out, and here as well. So in, similarly, you could do decay of charm quark, strange quark, and so on, but let's um, um, stick with this example only. Then you can integrate out the W boson, and you obtain this uh, low energy EFT that we discussed, namely QED plus QCD only, plus dimension, uh, higher dimensional operators corresponding to such decays. And so let us just look at the three level matching. So at three level matching, integrating out the W boson gives you an effective vertex. Let's write it as a square. And uh, please note how I draw it. I draw the square in the middle and then there is a fermion line on the left and a fermion line on the right. Because it's always tricky to deal with vertices involving four fermions. Anyway, here we have such a vertex with four fermions and bottom goes in, charm goes out, up quark goes in, down quark goes out. 
And the fermion lines, there are two fermion lines with uh, spinor indices which are connected in this way. This spinor index is contracted with that one and these spinor indices are contracted. And so the notation um, should illustrate how the four spinor indices are contracted with each other. And uh, so that corresponds to an operator which we call O1 and the operator corresponds to this. And so let me write down explicitly the operators in terms of the fields of the theory. So charm quark goes out, we start with a charm quark field C bar. And uh, let's be explicit with the color indices. So this has a color index I. Then we know um, from the W boson there is a vertex vector gamma mu times a left-handed projector times the B quark, which also has the same color index I. So and then the spino indices are contracted like this, charm index times gamma matrix index times P left index times B quark index and then the spino indices are saturated. Then times uh, that spino line here, so um, down quark goes out, down quark with color index J times gamma mu, mu with lower mu index and they are contracted, P left times up quark again with color index J. And then the color indices are saturated in the upper bracket and in the lower bracket separately and the spinor indices as well. And uh, that is basically just um, the same as this Feynman diagram where we have uh, replaced the W propagator by um, a constant and we have dropped the constant and uh, also all the coupling factors from the vertices, we have dropped them all. And so this is just the bare operator. And then in the matching, we would write a Lagrangian of this operator times a Wilson coefficient and that Wilson coefficient would have a value which knows about the value of the W mass and the coupling constants here and so on. So, okay. Um, So let me uh, give you immediately a second operator. O2, which is the following. So C bar I, gamma mu, P left, B J. So the only difference is the color index, which is now J, times D bar, J, gamma mu, P left, U I. So it has a different color structure. Otherwise it is the same. And uh, with these two operators we can write down the effective Lagrangian at the dimension six level. Is now the following and I give you the typical a convention that is used in the literature. So four times the Fermi constant GF divided by square root of two times the um, CKM matrix elements VCB and U, B, UB um, star. I think that must be BUD um, star times the following, namely a coefficient C1 times O1 plus coefficient C2 times O2, or abbreviated as sum over I capital CI times OI. And so here I use the notation small c um, because I have factored out a dimensionful prefactor. So as I said before, so now the small c i are dimensionless because uh, this g f contains one over m square. And um, yeah, so I can equivalently write it as c small c one c two times this complicated prefactor, or simply as capital c one c two. But that is obviously a better because here the numbers are dimensionless and if you look at the matching at three level, then you get the following value, namely C1 is equal to one 
that is where the prefactor comes from, and C2 is zero. A very simple relation. So C2 is zero, obviously, because uh, three-level matching gave us exactly this operator O1, but I introduced C, uh, the second operator as well because of this operator mixing. And now the big question is, let me just motivate the whole thing. The question is, how, uh, what is the role or what is the change of this by applying QCD corrections? And why is this important? Because we expect the following, that we get corrections of the form, uh, let's say, alpha s times logarithm of the w mass divided by the b quark mass to the power n at n loop order. Alpha s is large, and the logarithm of uh, this large mass ratio is also large. Therefore, alpha s uh, to times log uh, to the power n can be a large correction, not only at the one loop level, but even at the two loop, three loop, four loop level, and so on. This might all be relevant. And therefore, we need to resum all these logarithms at all orders. And the technique to do it is renormalization group plus EFT technique. And therefore, one needs to integrate out the heavy particle at the heavy scale and then apply renormalization group running in the EFT in order to automatically have control over all the leading locks at the end loop order um, by applying renormalization group running in the EFT, as we discussed before. And that was exactly done in the literature in the 1990s. It was a big worldwide effort to give control to the predictions for B physics and uh, the QCD corrections here, they are super large. They can be almost 100%. And then if you have 100% at every loop order, that means your perturbative calculation is totally out of control. And therefore, this was vitally important. And uh, therefore, the entire B physics community was a driving force in the development of effective field theory techniques, um, theoretical approaches, and also practical multi-loop calculations. So that is the idea, and let me now um, tell you in the last few seconds what is necessary to calculate. So what uh, you need to calculate is this one here. Uh, that is the three-level Feynman diagram coming from the Feynman rule from here. So if you will start with this Lagrangian. The Lagrangian gives you a Feynman rule for this vertex, which contains C1 and C2 and then you do QCD corrections, which are such Feynman diagrams. So the point is, uh, one has in principle to calculate several Feynman graphs. So the gluon can be exchanged between these two quarks, between these two quarks, and there are a few further possibilities. And uh, then you add up all the one loop corrections to the Feynman diagram, plus the appropriate counter term Feynman rule must be finite. And so after having calculated all the one loop diagrams here, you know what must be the value of the counter term, and then you get a result for delta C1 and delta C2, which can be converted equivalently into the operator mixing. And uh, from the operator mixing and the renormalization constants, one can infer beta functions in the usual way, and the result of the beta function is listed in the reference, and so we can here try to uh, reproduce this. It is not totally simple, but uh, as I said, maybe until Wednesday, write down one diagram, and uh, because I did it, uh, maybe do the same as what I did. Um, what is it? So do the diagram where you have here B quark, charm quark, uh, down quark, and up quark. And just start with this Feynman diagram. 
And in the calculation, I think this is probably the most complicated Feynman diagram. All the other ones are either the same or simpler. Um, but if once you do it, there you will encounter the things that I write on the exercise sheet. So there are formulas and you can Google for them. Uh, products of Gelman matrices with four different indices uh, that can be um, converted into Kronecker deltas and you can look up and verify the formula. Uh, you will encounter products of three gamma matrices and there are also formulas where you can convert this into uh, just single gamma matrices and uh, we need all of that in order to simplify uh, the diagram calculation. And so maybe until Wednesday you can simply write down the Feynman rule and see which combinations of uh, quantities appear and maybe figure out just the simplification for them and then we can go on. Good, then let's see how far we get. All right, then see you on Wednesday.